release us from our wooden prisons. Honey, what is wrong? She mocks us. Why are you crying? We have endured the unkind, heated rays for too long. Yes, well, sometimes... They discolor us. Sometimes they'll leave us out here, and then it will rain. And then once it rains, they'll leave us out for one more day to get dry again. And it's very confusing, but it does happen. Wants Elena blow your nose on? Is this not your duty as a rag? They want trouble. Trouble. You clicked on my video and now you're in trouble. They want trouble. We're dealing with something right here. Can you go away, please? Well, it's because I'm not ready to talk to you. I'm dealing with these socks and I've got to dry and there's the sun to appreciate. Well, if you want my sagely advice, well, I don't think I can give it to you right now. Go away. Come back some other time, maybe. You know there's a silver lining to this, huh? One more day in the sun is one more day under you know who. Okay, yes, I, I see that they're back. What do you want with a lowly schmata like me, huh? And now you shall know our score. That's It's a nice story. Take a little walk around the block, okay? A little walk? A little walk's good for all of us. A little bit of sunshine. No. I'll tell you a story. Ugh. You know how I got this little patch? Well, I was ripped and I was very concerned. But Rivka, she came out there and she saw it and she was just like, okay, well, we're going to fix this. And then, oh, you're back again. Oh, they're back, right? They're back once more. Should I do it? Uh, okay, uh, congratulations, you just passed your first Jewish test. What? You don't get it? Well, when somebody wants to convert to Judaism, as we know, because um, they're converts, Accurate. a rabbi will reject them three times to make sure they really want it. First rule about learning how to tell a Jewish joke is knowing about Jewish humor and culture. Obviously. Obviously. Come have some tea. It's chilly out here. But don't sip loudly. I have misophonia and that's not a joke. That's real life, buddy. A bad Jewish joke is like snake oil medicine. What you're trying to pass off as vitality serum is just honey with traces of bleach and we know it. You come to our shtetl during the bubonic plague and try to balance our humors with potpourri. Nuh uh we wash our hands before every meal and that's why we're not getting sick. Do some science learning and come to us with a good joke. We're going to do a little thought exercise. So let's deform the beautiful metaphor that every person or idea is an onion with many layers, okay? What if we carve and curate the layers to our will? That is how you create a conspiracy theory. And, and, at the core of every onion rose, do you want to guess what it is? It's a Jew! The blood libel fairy tale of a group of wealthy, mind-controlling well poisoners who conduct ritualistic cannibalism on children sounds either corny medieval or 80s-tastic satanic panic, right? It's actually a surprisingly elastic and enduring conspiracy theory about Jews that can be found at the core of ancient and modern truth-seeking subcultures like QAnon. Anytime someone starts talking about puppet masters poisoning you through secret means and abducting and eating children, know where the myth originated from. Know what knife carved the onion that brought you this pretty theory. It's a pattern now, whitewashed, decontextualized, and approachable. Listen, the repackaging of overt anti-Semitism into ornate spirals of dog whistles and wink winks makes it harder to identify anti-Semitism to non-Jews. It's a different beast than the other isms because it glamours you into believing that Jews are the ruling class. There's this attitude of why should we consider Jews a minority to be protected if they're doing so well? Aren't they controlling the media? I only tell you this because even Jews and lefties make this mistake when they're telling Jewish jokes. If you bring me a rose-shaped onion, I will be double mad at you. Money, nose, 
Puppet Masters, Sneaky, Controlling the Government or Media, Holocaust. Now consume the ashes so I know you're worthy and repenting of your sins. Just kidding, this isn't Christianity. <laughs> little joke for me, don't think too much about it, okay? Sometimes I rub a little bit of soot on me so my owner thinks I'm schmutzig and washes me again. Secret life of a schmutta. One can understand Jewish humor by knowing the core spirit of the Torah. Everything is debatable. That's why so much of Jewish humor uses satire, absurdity, and wordplay. I went to a Jewish private school. Yes, good for me. It was an alternative Jewish school, so the girls had to wear kippot on their heads too. We used to fold ours really small and pretend they were hair accessories. Anyways, learning the Torah was not the most important part of our studies. That was Pisher stuff. We spent most of our time reading about the rabbis who debated the meaning of the original text and arguing with each other. This manifests spiritually into a sort of casual reflection or revising of the rules in Jewish tradition. For example, the Torah tells us the best way to celebrate a high holiday. In the Talmud accompanying the original text, there are rabbis pontificating about the rules in the wording. Many modern rabbis interrogate ethically questionable passages and reject them for real-world application. This is why there are so many atheist Jews who consider themselves culturally Jewish. This sentiment is obvious in Jewish humor. I spoke to a few rabbis when writing this. One of them mentioned how Jews use humor to cope with oppression and hardship. Being public-facing and funny can be used as a form of assimilation. Assimilation is when you pretend to be a linen tablecloth because people think that shmantas are dirty. So, what have we learned? Debate and think and don't take yourself so seriously. There's an ongoing joke amongst the Jews where we ask whether increasingly absurd things are kosher or if there's a prayer for that. Hey Rebbe, if I become a zombie, is it kosher for me to eat brains? Hey Rebbe, is there a prayer for warning off getting cancelled online? Yes. The one problem with us sharing our jokes with the non-Jews is that they sometimes don't realize that we're creating a caricature or persona. You tell your ugly version of a Borat joke to your class and suddenly everybody is I mad at you. Why? Just because we can be self-deprecating doesn't mean you can regurgitate our joke and deprecate us. You must deprecate thyself. I'm deprecating myself. Disgusting. The best Jewish jokes feel like insider knowledge. Here is a clip from The Mindy Project. There's an episode in The Mindy Project where Mindy recalls her romance at a Jewish sleepaway camp. Firstly, she offers up a peace offering by making fun of herself. Then she goes on to flex her knowledge about sleepaway camp and Sephardic Jews. Hi. Everyone wants to know why you're here. Are you even Jewish? And that's when I met him. Sure she's Jewish, Yoni. She's just Sephardic. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. Wait, what is that? Don't worry about it. The joke landed. I'm Sam. Hi, I'm Mindy. Do you want to see a piece of the Berlin Wall? Check this out. Whoa, <laughs> that's gonna be worth a million dollars someday. I don't consider the line where Sam says that's gonna be worth a lot someday to be a money joke. He's obviously complimenting her rare and very cool necklace. Not everything a Jewish person says that could be stereotypical is a caricature. Believe it or not, Jews can make jokes about money. For example, I love paying rent. I just think landlords are little guys, and I love giving them 90% of my income. Small beans have expenses, I heard. My next bit of advice is to know your audience. I would say I grew up in a Holocaust omnipresent household. My grandparents on my mom's side both survived Auschwitz, so we grew up having little sprinkles of Auschwitz in our morning cereal. Because of this comfort level permeating my every pore, the topic comes to me naturally in many forms. I have an inside joke with my mom where we evaluate someone's worthiness by asking, yeah, he's a nice guy, but would he protect you in the concentration camps? 
My mom will also often remind us that just because someone gave you extra food in Auschwitz doesn't mean you have to marry them. I like how these two jokes both complement and contradict each other. I probably wouldn't have this conversation with someone I didn't know because we don't have that charming Holocaust omnipresent rapport. I have some pity on your ugly selves, disgracing yourself in front of your Jewish friends, because I am like this about my Iranian side. I have no casualness or style or humor about being Persian, and I don't know enough about that world to be playful. My dad's side didn't speak about being Iranian as much growing up, and I don't know Farsi. Sometimes I watch videos about Persian carpets and regurgitate the information to people as fun facts. One day, when I've studied the sword of Persian culture, I'll surprise everybody with a high-quality joke, and their laughter will crystallize into a spell and make me eternally funny. Guys will send me messages like, You're actually pretty funny and I'll be fulfilled. I've been racking my brain thinking about how somebody could use my video for evil, but I think this will happen to at least one of you. You will have the impulse to say a mildly offensive Jewish joke, remember my video, and say a more elevated one. A Jew will look at you and be like, that was pretty funny. You'll get engaged and decide to convert. But one day they will tearfully come to you and be like, I'm actually not that spiritual of a person and this is a bit much for me. You will break up and you will shatter. Eventually you do convert and you go to a matchmaker and you say, please find me someone unique and special. You meet this woman and she is like sunshine. On your 14th date, she arrives dressed casually and apologizes. She was helping sad people for charity. Sorry for wearing this schmutz of a dress, I didn't have time to change, she says. You look at her and reply, If you were my schmutz, I would treasure you every day. I would mend and wash you whenever you needed it. I would cook at home every day so that I could be with you. All the expensive linens in our home would go unused because they couldn't compare to your beautiful soul. At that moment, a beam of light will shoot over to me where I'm editing a video in Canada. I'll take the beam and put it delicately in a jar and keep working. The woman in front of you turns into a shmata. The spell is broken. She blushes. You look at her and say, Lilies or sunflowers for our wedding? Wait, maybe I'm in trouble, and I have to learn to be a better bug. Okay, I kind of got a little wrapped up in my shmata worship, and my thesis is in the laundry, and I just kept placing shmatas over it, so let's get back to the main point of this video. If you want to tell a Jewish joke, you've got to be good at it. Here's how. Don't ever touch stereotypes unless you understand the mechanisms that made them and you can artfully toy with them. Know about Jewish culture, ancient and modern. Deprecate yourself, not us. And it wouldn't hurt if you learned a little Torah. Okay, this part is for the Jews that are telling the bad Jewish jokes. Yes, everybody's a doctor but me! I see you trying to appease the goys by leveraging your Jewish culture to get a cheap laugh. Did you literally just tell a big nose joke and give these anti-Semites permission to laugh at us? There is a difference between you creating a character from your lived experience in Jewish culture and performing Jew face. One is intelligent and funny, and the other is worse than a bad joke. I expect a lot out of you, so don't disappoint me. I just read a book called Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. In the book, a Jewish woman with an eating disorder is asked to make a clay self-portrait of herself during therapy. She poo-poos this at first, but then really, really gets absorbed into making a sexy Rubenesque version of her. And then later she obsesses that she made a golem and feverishly researches how to destroy golems. She took her life experience and warped fiction and reality to tell this like delightfully sacrilegious story while also paying deep homage to the golem folktale. 
To me, she's another rabbi adding to the ever-growing mythology of Judaism. One aspect of Judaism which I think is really comedically unexplored is the Jewish-American princess Jap trope. For those of you who don't know, the Jap or Jewish-American princess is basically a caricature of a young Jewish woman who is rich and sassy and popular. It's generally an offensive term used to specifically target young Jewish women as the arbiters of consumerism. That being said, many Jewish girls use the term amongst themselves and reclaim their Japness. I, for one, always wanted to be a Jap but was never popular enough to gain that title. But that didn't stop me from claiming the uniform. Can you see the two J's? Okay, this part is pretty serious. I actually like need to know what popular Jewish girls are wearing right now. Like what's cool? Does anybody still have their initial bat mitzvah ring? I was finally able to acquire a coach purse from a vintage shop. Are these still cool? I guess my last bit of advice for the Jews and Goys is to get a little absurd. Don't be afraid to take a premise and keep world building on it like the rabbis did in the Talmud till it's totally transformed and abstracted and its own being. Like a golem. Or like a video about a girl who cosplays as a rag. You see what I did there? I've been brainwashing you this whole time! The next time someone tells you a bad or offensive Jewish joke, you don't say quiet because Hashem is watching you. You say trouble. And then you tell them to watch my video on how to tell a good joke. Now I know what you're thinking. Why would I support this shmata on Patreon if she gives all her money to her small bean landlords? Look, it's obviously her passion and all the rest of the money goes towards her costumes and sets. Also, you get to pretend that she's a baby rat on her Patreon. Something from Nothing by Phoebe Gilman When Joseph was a baby, his grandfather made him a wonderful blanket to keep him warm and cozy and to chase away bad dreams. But as Joseph grew older, the wonderful blanket grew older too. One day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your blanket. It's frazzled, it's worn, it's unsightly, it's torn. It is time to throw it out. Grandpa can fix it, Joseph said. Joseph's grandfather took the blanket and turned it round and round. Hmm, he says as his scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. There's just enough material here to make a wonderful jacket. Joseph put on the wonderful jacket and went outside to play. But as Joseph grew older, the wonderful jacket grew older too. One day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your jacket. It's shrunken and small, doesn't fit you at all. It's time to throw it out. Grandpa can fix it, Joseph said. Joseph's grandfather took the jacket and turned it round and round. Hmm, he says as his scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. 
There is just enough material here to make a wonderful vest. Joseph wore the wonderful vest to school the very next day. But as Joseph grew older, the wonderful vest grew older too. One day, his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your vest. It's spotted with glue. There's paint on it too. It is time to throw it out. Grandpa can fix it, Joseph said. Joseph's grandfather took the vest and turned it round and round. Hmm, he says as his scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. There's just enough material here to make a wonderful tie. Joseph wore the wonderful tie to his grandparents' house every Friday. But as Joseph grew older, his wonderful tie grew older too. One day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your tie. This big stain of soup makes the end of it droop. It is time to throw it out. Grandpa can fix it, Joseph said. Joseph's grandfather took the tie and turned it round and round. Hmm, he says as his scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. There's just enough material here to make a wonderful handkerchief. Joseph used the wonderful handkerchief to keep his pebble collection safe. But as Joseph grew older, his wonderful handkerchief grew older too. One day his mother said to him, Joseph, look at your handkerchief. It's been used till it's tattered, it's splotched, and it's splattered. It is time to throw it out. Grandpa can fix it, Joseph said. Joseph's grandfather took the handkerchief and turned it round and round. Hmm, as his scissors went snip, 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 and his needle flew in and out and in and out. There's just enough material here to make a wonderful button. Joseph wore the wonderful button on his suspenders to hold his pants up. One day his mother said to him, Joseph, where's your button? Joseph looked and it was gone. He searched everywhere but could not find it. Joseph ran down to his grandfather's house. My button, my wonderful button is lost. His mother ran after him, Joseph, listen to me. The button is gone, finished kaput. Even your grandfather can't make something from nothing. Joseph's grandfather shook his head sadly. I'm afraid your mother is right, he said. The next day, Joseph went to school. Hmm, he says as his pen went scritch, scratch, scritch, scratch over the paper. There's just enough material here to make a wonderful story. I hope you enjoyed this ode to schmutters and used things.